fun. Hey, welcome back to Mississippi Stories. I'm Marshall Ramsey, editor at large at Mississippi Today. Got a great guest today, somebody I've known for a long time. Actually, he and I share a name. In fact, we pretty much share our whole name, considering my first name is Tom. So I have Tom Ramsey on with me today. He is a chef, a raconteur, a writer, media personality. I'm going to read the bio here. He now lives okay. in New Orleans, but he's from Vicksburg and spent a long time here in Jackson. A lot of folks in Jackson know and love Tom. He, he's a writer. He's uh, he, he was he was an investment banker at one time, but now he's the executive oh, chef. Here. Yeah, it's amazing. He made that transition. Well, I guess we can touch on that too. At, at Atchafalaya Restaurant in the Irish Channel in the Channel neighborhood of New Orleans, and he writes about food and travel at the contributing editor of Okra Magazine. He's also a new dad, which is kind of cool, and we'll talk about that here in a yeah. second. And he is um, now sans oxygen after uh, a really tough bout with COVID, and so it's very nice to see you unplugged, I guess it, you could say. It's great, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know you missed the tank, but it, it, you do look great, and I'm very glad you're healthy. Tom, thanks for joining today. Glad, glad to be here. And you know, one of these days we're going to figure out how we're related, because um, there's no way that this, you know, this good looks and your good luck. I mean, it's it, it's it's got to be there. Bad eyesight, handsome face. I would know. say we probably need to do 23 and Me and figure this thing out, because you know it could cause all kinds of discoveries. I hear. Well, it. Uh, <laughs> It, it can cause uh, it can cause happy accidents. Uh, yes, I, I as you said, as you hinted at, I am a, a proud new papa of a thirty-year-old daughter. Uh, they're hard to change, I hear. Yeah, yeah, they're uh, they're 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 a little mouthy, you know. They uh, they're they're a little bossy when you uh, when the, the newborns are thirty years old. Um, it's it's a pretty cool story. I. I was uh, in the car on the way to Arkansas with um, with Alan, uh, who is the um, bar manager at Chafalaya. Yeah. And, and we were on our way up there to do a private gig where I was cooking. He was making drinks and uh, at this, you know, multi-million dollar hunting lodge. And my I got a my phone rang. It was my son, Stuart. And I you know answered it and he goes dad i'm freaking out he goes some some lady named jessica says she's my sister <laughs> well okay, okay son don't don't freak out too much that's a it's not out of the realm of possibilities let's you know what exactly did she say and he said she said that she matched as a half sibling with wit that's my other son uh one of my other sons um matched as a half sibling with wit on 23 and me and she sent me a, a screenshot of 23 and me and i said well she only matched with wit i said she didn't match with you and he goes I, i'm not on that stupid website i said okay well there's two possibilities either i'm not wit's dad or you've got a sister that's right. pretty much you know i said i send her three questions and we can narrow this down pretty quickly and he says okay what did i write and i said well ask her how old are you where were you born and most importantly what's your mother's name and he writes back and he goes oh my gosh she's, she's texting back and he goes she's 30 and i said okay so she's a full year older than you that predates me even knowing your mother i mean that's you know that's back into the old days of college and he goes, okay, she's from Hattiesburg. And I said, okay, we are checking off some boxes here. Uh, and then he said her mother's name. And I said, oh, nope, doesn't ring a bell. Um, yeah, just sorry. And he goes, well, what, what do you mean? I said, I, it, was, it was the 80s. I was popular, you know. Um, and he goes, well, what do we do? And I said, well, you've got a sister. So, you know, that's pretty cool. I said, let's. You know, let's call your brother, tell him, then we'll call Kitty and uh, my wife and uh, we'll, you know, we'll work this out. And so we called Wit and told him the story and he was like, hey, wow, cool. I got a sister, you know, totally on brand for him. Yeah. Then we called Kitty, you know, my wife of 15 years, long suffering Kitty. Um <clears throat> And said, I, "Are you sitting down? Because I've got uh, I got some big news." I said, uh, "I've got a thirty year old daughter," and her response also completely on brand. And I'm paraphrasing here, but she said, 
oh my God, well, where is she? Where does she live? What does she do? Is she married? Does she have children? Oh, do we have, do we have grandchildren? And I said, hang on, I, I, I don't know any of this. And so I told Stuart, I said, well, you know, we're just gonna welcome this young lady into the family. I said, you know, this is, this is exciting, happy news. And he goes, okay, all right, well, you sure? And I said, I mean, of course I'm sure. It's 30, yeah. She's 30, you know, and he goes, I said, well, give her my phone number. And he said, are you sure, dad? And I said, look, it's 30. It's not like she's running me down for child support or something. I said, you know, this is, this is a grown woman. Let's, let's meet her. And so uh, he gave her my number and within 10 seconds, uh, my phone rang and this sweet voice on the other end of the line says, you know, hi. And I said, you know, hey, um, welcome to the family. You know, it's wonderful to hear from you. I, I'm, I'm excited. I, I welcome to the this big, crazy family of ours. Um, I said, but I have to ask you, you know, how am I just learning this? And she says, well, I'm just finding out. Uh, she said, uh, my whole life, I thought this other guy um, was my dad. And... I did, I got a 23 in me um, test and um, it came back and said that I was 99.96% European. And I said, and? And she goes, oh, well, so-and-so is half Japanese. And I said, oh, okay. So yeah, so she asked her mom, she says, you know, well, what's up with this? And, uh, and she's estranged from her mom and, um, the guy has never been a part of her life. You know, she's only met him a couple of times. And uh, so it's, this wasn't some, you know, huge <clears throat> shake up in a family. And she says, well, if it's not so-and-so, it must be this guy named Tom Ramsey. And she said, you know, I met him at this, at this party after a play and, um, you know, went from there and, so she went online, went on Facebook, found a bunch of Tom Ramsey's and just through internet snooping with a friend, kind of figured it out. And then um, Wit got a 23 and me for Christmas from somebody. And so, you know, just recently it, he took his 23 and me and it sprung up on her feed that she had a half sibling. And so that's how we found out about each other. And so I said, you know, look, I'm, I'm on my way to Arkansas, but I'll be back in town uh, Friday. Uh, when is your, you know, and I found out she lives in New Orleans. I mean, she lives in Mississippi um, in Summerall, but works in New Orleans. She's a, uh, she's an ICU nurse at Oshner. And um, so, I mean, she works a couple of miles from where I am. Um, and so we made plans that on her first night off, she would, you know, come meet the whole family. Yeah. And um, so we talked on the phone, you know, a hundred times between, you know, the first conversation and the first time we met. Um, and I mean, she's just a, she's a delight. She's, yeah, she's married. She's, um, her husband's a super nice guy and she lives 20 minutes from Wit, my second son. <clears throat> and so Wit decided on the, after this first conversation, um, he had, you know, talked to her once and knew about her for like 45 minutes before he called her and said, you know, listen, I live 20 minutes from you. I'm Katie, his wife, he's Katie and I are going to come pick you up and, and have dinner. And so the, you know, the day he found out about her, they were having dinner that night. Oh, that's great. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, and yeah. everybody just kind of jumped in and was like, hey, you know, new family. Well, and I love the pictures on Facebook. I swear you look at her and right through here. Oh, yeah. I mean, she looks just like you. It, it's, it's amazing. And, and she, we compared her, some of her baby pictures to like my mother's baby pictures. Yeah. And they're, they're twins. I mean, it, it's, it's uncanny. And, um, but we, you know, we made arrangements to meet on the 18th of January. And so we decided to have a picnic outside. And um, so all three sons, you know, Zach, Stuart, and Witt were there. Stuart 
brought his girlfriend, Whit brought his wife, Jessica came with her husband, uh, Kitty and I were there. We met in Triangle Park, which is right here in a little old neighborhood that I live in uh, on Algiers Point. And we had this, you know, nicely socially distant, appropriate picnic. And, you know, it was fantastic. It, it was after the first like awkward five minutes of, you know, crying and hugging and all that. Um, then it was just, I mean, it just felt like a family picnic that was one of a hundred, you know, it was, she just fit right in. She's a smart ass like we are. Um, it's just, it's, it's been wonderful. Uh, the only downside to that picnic is apparently I had COVID and was asymptomatic and found out two days later, was diagnosed two days later, and I gave everybody at the picnic COVID. Oh, you're kidding me. No, oh, everybody, no. everybody who wasn't vaccinated. Um, so, or vaccinated or had immunity from having COVID. So Jessica had both of her vaccines. Zach had had COVID six months ago. And uh, Stuart's girlfriend, Aaron, had had two vaccines. Everybody else that was there got COVID. Um, I mean, every, it was 100%, you know, I was like typhoid Mary. Well, the thing is, and I know Kitty got it also, uh, your wife, and we're looking like right now, if I think, if, if my memory's correct, didn't she have COVID like exactly a year ago? So she, this was, she got it like a second time. She did. She she got it uh, right after Mardi Gras last year uh, when everybody in New Orleans that, you know, was, was getting it. Um, and then, and hers, I mean, she had symptoms that lasted from March into, you know, July. Yeah. And uh what the smell thing um and then felt fine and then caught it again yeah uh, but you know, which we're learning is not is not that uncommon that the natural immunity really only lasts about six months well it's kind uh, of like actually when you have a cold you know you're going yeah. to get a cold probably the next year too with the same type of virus yeah. the, the thing was you know here she and i saw that she got pretty sick the second she actually i think she got sicker the second time almost than she did the first time it seemed like yeah, she actually was in the hospital with me for uh almost two days well you said you were asymptomatic however all hell broke loose because it it quickly didn't you know quickly got worse for you and it you did. said you went I, to the hospital but it, you actually got sicker than she did oh i i was i i had anything that could go wrong i got it um so i was diagnosed on wednesday morning and I, I had a sinus headache and some real sinus blockage. And because I work in the restaurant industry, I, I, I've been tested. This was, I think, my ninth test. I mean, I've, I've been tested a lot. And usually when I get the test, I would pull up to the, the place, run inside. They'd hit me with a swab, wave, and out I'd go. Um, and this time they hit me with a swab. And the next thing I see is they came in you know, looking like they were going scuba diving. I mean, just oh, everybody wow. all, yeah. And I was like, oh, great. Yeah. And they said, okay, you, you've got COVID. They gave me a prescription for some steroids and some, you know, some other, other things and told me to, you know, stay really hydrated, take the steroids and just to watch my, you know, just yeah, keep an eye on, on the other symptoms. Yeah. And so I, when I immediately called everybody and said, okay, everybody's got to go get tested because, you know, I've gotten, I, you know, there's a chance that all of you have gotten sick. Um, one of my friends down here is this, is the actor Noah Wiley. I don't know if you remember him from ER. I had had breakfast with him the day before and I called him and said, hey, you got to go get tested. Um, and he, so they had to shut down the set of his new TV show and and so he went and got tested. He had to quarantine for a week. He never, he didn't get it. I, I didn't infect him. So I, I didn't kill off Dr. Carter from, from ER. Um, and then everybody starts calling and saying, okay, yep, I'm positive, I'm positive, I'm positive. And it was just a nightmare. Kitty tested negative the first time. And then three days later went back and tested positive. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, well, she just kept getting sicker. Yeah. Uh, and I had to call the restaurant. Luckily, I hadn't been there in, you know, four days. And so they didn't have to shut down. Um, but it was, you know, kind of a, a cascading 
one man super spreader event. And um, I uh, was doing pretty well. I mean, I wasn't feeling all that terrible. I was, you know, I had a cough. I had, uh, you know, the typical symptoms. And then on the 27th, I was diagnosed on the 20th. On the 27th, uh, well, my daughter got me a pulse oximeter, you know, to, to check my oxygen. And I was in the bed and my, I was just, I, I couldn't catch my breath. And I checked my oxygen and it was high 70s, low 80s, something like that. Ooh. And it was bad. Yeah. And I told Kitty, I said, you know, I need to go to the hospital. And she tested her oxygen. It was pretty low. And so we just called Zach and he drove us to um, the emergency room in Oshner. And by the time I got to Oshner, my pulse set, my oxygen saturation was right at 70. Um, so normal which, is 100 and anything really under 92, you need to go to the hospital and you were at 70. I was at 70. Yeah. And so they put me on oxygen and said immediately, you know, we're admitting you did a chest x-ray came back and told me that Kitty's oxygen was pretty low and they were going to admit her as well. And they had us in two separate rooms to start with. Um, and, you know, they put me on a drip. They put me on remdesivir and um, antibiotics. I mean, they've, they've come so far into learning a course of treatment now yeah. that, you know, when this first started, if I had gone in the hospital, they wouldn't have known what to do other than just watch me deteriorate, put me on a ventilator and then call in a priest. I mean, right. um, now they've got, you know, some pretty effective courses of treatment. Uh, the next day they brought Kitty and I into the same room. Um, and um, they, uh, Kitty went home. I can't remember if, we, if she spent the night in the room together or if she went home that evening. I, I, it's all kind of running together. Um, but my oxygen needs, just kept going up. I went from needing, you know, four liters of oxygen to six to 12 to 20 to 30. And it just kept getting worse and worse. Um, they took me off of the cannula, which is just like the little tube that sits under your nose and put this mask on me, which was more of a forced oxygen. Yeah. Well, it wasn't the forced oxygen. It was just a, just a mask so that I was, it was more dispersed and um, that was the worst night because I couldn't sleep because the mask is so loud and it's this hard plastic. And if you try to move at all, it was scratching my face and it's got so much just cold air blowing into your mouth and throat that I was just constantly dry mouth and drinking water. And I drank so much water then I'm doing nothing but pee in every 45 minutes. It was just, it was horrible. I didn't sleep at all. So I was without sleep for over 36 hours. And at that point, my um, oxygen needs outstripped what they could give me in a normal room. <clears throat> they can only give you like 35 liters of oxygen in a regular room. And so they came in and said they were taking me to ICU, which scared the hell out of me. Uh, but they were constantly trying to reassure me. Oh, no, 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 it's not, you know, it's, it's not that bad. You're going to, you just need more oxygen than we can give you in this room. So we have to put you in ICU. Um, I get to the ICU and it goes from 30 to 50 to 60. I mean, it just keeps going up how much oxygen I need. And they switched me to a liquid diet, which really terrified me. And I said, you know, what's up with the liquid diet? And they said, uh, well, you know, just in case we have to intubate you, you know, we don't want you to have any solids in your stomach. And, and now I'm just terrified. Right. <laughs> um, and, and in ICU, you can't move more than about four feet from the bed yeah. um, because you're, you're on a different kind of monitor that's hardwired and you're not on this wireless monitor. Uh, by this time I'm on, I've got drips in both arms. I've got the oxygen on my nose with this device called a, a vapotherm, which warms up water, mists it into the oxygen and forces it like crazy up your nose. It's this, it's like a super high pressure cannula that looks like McDonald's straws. You know, it's, it's really thick. It's not that little, little thing that fits under your nose. And um, it was, I mean, it, it was scary, you know. So and, seriously, you had literally gone from one of the coolest moments of your life, finding out you got this yeah. really neat woman in your life now, yeah. 
within three weeks, you're laying there in ICU, you know, with them saying, oh, it's going to be okay. And you're yeah. thinking, oh, God, I'm not going to make it. Yeah, it was, um, I mean, it, it wasn't until later that I was, when I was feeling a lot better that they told me how close I was to, you know, disaster. But um, they, the respiratory therapists at Ochsner are so on their game and they've seen so many COVID patients that they now know things to do ahead of the curve yeah. to keep it from getting worse as opposed to what they were dealing with nine months ago, which was reacting. You know, oh, this is bad. Now let's try this. And they were reacting to things instead of being preactive, um, being proactive. And so <clears throat> when my oxygen got down to, got up to needing, you know, more than 50 liters, and that's 50 liters a minute. That's how they, how they measure that. Um, they put me on what's called a BiPAP which is, I don't know if you ever, if you sleep with a CPAP. Right. Yeah, sorry, yeah, right. A, a BiPAP fits over your nose and your mouth and fits tight with, it, it seals up against your face and it forces air in and then creates negative pressure to aid in exhaling, get clearing the CO2. And so they put that on me to kind of ward off having to intubate me. Right. And they said, you know, usually we put these on people to let them sleep, but we're going to put this on you, turn it all the way up, and we want you to wear it for 36 hours straight and see if we can force some, you know, use of your lungs. And so they put that thing on me, um, and they said, if you tolerate it, we're going to leave it on for 36 hours. And it, it, it was fine. I mean, it didn't bother me. It was really helping. Um, and... <clears throat> After 36 hours, they were like, okay, we're turning the oxygen down to 50, you know? So they were starting to decrease my oxygen. Yeah. Um, and so that is, so them being proactive with the BiPAP kept me off a ventilator and probably saved my life. Um, what they told me later was that uh, I said, well, how close was I to going on a ventilator? And they said, well, we kept it right outside the door of your room we didn't want to bring it into the room and frighten you with it, but it was sitting that we kept a ventilator unit outside your door because um, we were convinced at any moment we'd have to come in and, and you know, vent you. And so that BiPAP, oh, and, and the recovery rate right now for males my age with, you know, any, like I'm overweight. So uh, overweight males, 55 years old, the chance of coming off the ventilator is 25%. Right. So you didn't want that. Yeah, right. And so uh, them thinking ahead and thinking quickly and putting me on the BiPAP um, is, it, I mean, it saved my life. Um, and then the weirdest thing happened the, the day after the 36 hours on the BiPAP. Yeah, you know, they were, they kept me on it for a good bit and they said, you know, take it off to eat and we'll take it off for different times in the day. <clears throat> so I was sitting there just on the Vapotherm and I was reading and, um, and I got that same feeling I got when I first went to the hospital, like just somebody pulled a battery out of me yeah. and I was sitting on the bed and I just slumped over and can remember the nurse running in there and putting the BiPAP on me, putting the BiPAP back on me and saying, well, let's just, you know, let's lay you down and get, let you get some sleep. And um, I obviously had a pretty high fever. Uh, I went sound asleep and I woke up several hours later and I was wet from head to toe. Like my hair was wet, my shirt was wet, my pajama pants were wet. I mean, I was, I had soaked sweat through everything I had. I mean, just was soaking wet and um, got up. And when I woke up, I'm like, wow, I'm wet, but I can breathe. And the nurse came in and took the, took the BiPAP off and got a stethoscope and was like, wow, we, we can hear air movement in different parts of your lungs. And just something about that super high fever 
it got your immune system kicked in and it started you, you turned the corner. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, from that day, they my oxygen needs just fell off a cliff. And uh, four days later, I was back in a regular room on, you know, four liters of oxygen and was going home two days later. Yeah. Um, so when, when you were by yourself with an ICU, I mean, that had to be incredibly lonely because you and Kitty were together and then suddenly you get yeah. yanked out of the room yeah. and then you get a lot of time to start thinking, which has oh, to be it, the worst part, you know. It's, it's terribly lonely. And um, luckily, Kitty had put together a, um, a spreadsheet because I could get one visitor a day. Yeah. Um, that one was good. yeah. And they had, they put them all in PPE. They looked like, you know, look, look like something. yeah. yeah. Oh, it looked like something out of that movie contagion, you know, uh, but Kitty had put together a spreadsheet and people signed up to come visit. And that was uh, just incredible. Uh, and, and when I say came come visit, these are friends of mine that would come and sit for, for hours. Yeah. Like the, the nurse would finally come in and go, you have to leave, you know, um, and friends would sit there for hours. Um, and it was forever before I got to see Kitty. I think it was uh, 16 days before I got to see her because, you know, she had had COVID and they wanted her to be X number of days past a negative test or past symptoms before she could come see me. So I didn't get to see my wife for 16 days. Um, I don't think I've ever gone 16 days without seeing my wife. Um, it was, it was lonely. It was just bleak. Um, and especially because in ICU, like I was saying, you're, you're hardwired in, so you can't move more than a couple of feet. And so you're either in the bed or sitting in a chair and that's it. You can't get up and walk around. You can't do anything. And, um, and plus I had developed what they call COVID clots. Oh, uh, wow. yeah. I had clots in my legs, so they had to put me on. They had to put me on a uh, an IV drip of uh, blood thinners, which then they said for the first two days I couldn't get out of the bed. So I was literally sitting, either sitting or laying in a bed for forty eight hours. Um, and it's just, it's bone crushingly, just bleak. Um, it's it, it, there's no way to describe it um, other than just you know depressing and lonely and. Um, but, you know, the doctors, they, the, the doctors and my daughter um, tend to fuss at me. Um, you you kind of know my personality. I'm uh, kind of, you know, like a shark. I never stop moving. Um, I've, you know, before, I, before this, I was as strong as an ox. I mean, you could, you know, throw a yoke on me and I could plow a field for you. And just the, the whole feeling of, needing someone else to do something for you, no matter what, how small it is, you know, get ice for me. You know, it's just, you you just, you feel helpless. And as I've uh, recovered and started, you know, doing things for myself, I, I want the recovery to be tomorrow. You know, I want to be able to get back on my motorcycle tomorrow and go in and and run a shift at, at, at a Chafalaya. And so I keep complaining that, you know, this is taking forever that, you know, it's been three months since uh, I got sick and, you know, why is it taking so long and, or two months. Um, and the doctors have told me that, you know, my recovery is remarkable that, you know, that it's, it's incredible that, that I'm where I am now. And I, I, I tell, I said, what do you, what do you mean? I said, I, I feel like, I feel like a, a, a sack full of broken glass, you know, how, how, how do you mean I'm doing better? And they, they've said, you know, people who were as sick as you were um, in the ICU on 70 liters of oxygen on a bike, on a forced air BiPAP, um, their average stay in just in ICU was six weeks. Wow. They said, you know, anybody that was as sick as you were would still be in ICU. Yeah. And, you know, you're at home, you know, you're at, you're at home walking around making coffee and doing laundry, you know, just so you're doing great. Don't, don't let it get you down. Um, and I, they tell me that. And then I immediately go, well, yeah, but why can't I go ride my motorcycle? Um, so it's, it's, it's encouraging and frustrating at the same time. 
Um, but as you can tell, I've been sitting here talking to you for, you know. Yeah, you 30, sound great. You really do. I mean, I, and, it's, and, I'm, yeah. and I'm not winded, you know. Right. Um, I, of course, I'll turn off Zoom and pass out. But uh, <laughs> but it's yeah, it's been a wild ride, and um, you know, it's I, I've written about it for um, for a friend of mine's magazine. I've tried to stay focused and positive. But it's um, it's it's difficult. It's it's probably the hardest thing I've ever had to deal with. Yeah, you know, it's I've been very grateful that you and Kitty have been very open about this and have been talking about a lot. There have been a lot of people in Mississippi and in Jackson. I get a lot of things say, hey, have you heard about Tom? What's the latest on Tom? What's going on with Tom? And you all were very good to do real time to be able. And I know, you know, as tired and as sick as you were to be able to actually put out the energy to be able to type a post was probably most of the energy you had for that day. Why did you decide to do that? Just to kind of put your your I, I have encountered I've encountered so many people. Um, I mean, I, I, I interact with hundreds of people a day right. uh, in a, in a, on a normal day. Um, and there were so many people I encountered at the restaurant who just refused to believe that this is real. Um, people that would, you know, come in and you ask them to put on a mask and they would be mad about it. Um, they would, you know, when I would go to the table wearing a mask, they would go, oh, you can take that thing off. This, this, this stuff isn't real. And, uh, and just the, the amount of negativity I saw uh, surrounding um, COVID, just when I got sick, I was like, this can't, you know, people need to know what this is really like. Um, and so I just decided, well, the easiest way for me to do my part in this is just to be as open and honest and transparent as possible and let people see exactly what this disease can do to a person as strong as, as, as I was. Um, that it's not something that's just killing off people in nursing homes or it's, it's not just like the flu or it's not you know a hoax or any of the other things that you were hearing. And so I said, you know, the only way for me to feel good about this and feel like I'm doing my part um, is to just bear it all, just to let people see exactly the good, the bad, you know, and I tried to stay positive, but you know, in my posts, I've always tried to stay fairly positive about what's going on. But I mean, people could look at me and see that I look like, you know, you know, I, I looked like a, a potato thrown down the stairs. I mean, it was, I was just kind of gray and terrible looking and bruised up. Um, I looked like a, a back alley, you know, heroin addict with all the, just, I had purple just all up and oh, down. Really? Is that just from the lack of, lack of oxygen? No, it was the, they, they had to come in and take my blood oh, every, yeah. you know, twice a day. And, um, you know, when you're, when you're in the hospital and you're just laying there, you're, you spend most of your time kind of dehydrated, your, your veins are all deflated and they're having to jab around on you. Um, they were running out of places to take blood out of me. Um, it's, it, it's, it's horrible. And, you know, and I even talked about, you know, the, just the, just the parts that were just so dehumanizing, like having to use a bucket to go to the bathroom and, you know, I tried to put some humor in it, but um, when you just really start to lose your common dignity, um, it's, it's demoralizing and people need to know that, you know, you take, this needs to be taken seriously. And, and if, if you don't, if you, if you play with it, you'll get sick. I mean, I was careful and I got sick. Yeah. Um, it just, you know, you, you just increase your odds. Being around so many people, um, you're just bound to come across it. And it's... Well, I saw where Kitty got her vaccine or is getting it. Uh, yeah. Went with her yesterday. She got yeah. her first shot. Uh, she said today it's sore like a bad tetanus shot. Yeah. Um, I, I'll get mine. I go, I go back for my um, follow-up uh, on Tuesday. And the doctor that I see has told me he wants me to go ahead and get my uh, vaccine sooner rather than later. He's 
kind of steering me toward the J&J &J vaccine just because I'm not feeling well and it has a little, it has lower efficacy, but it also has a lower side effect ratio. So um, he says in, in, in all balancing out, he would, that it might be good for me to wait, you know, a month until that's really available. Um, he says, but anything beyond that, let's go ahead and get, just take first available. Um, I've, uh, you know, I've, the, what's been really, really encouraging to me is people have responded to my Facebook posts with pictures of their vaccination cards nice. saying, I, I was skeptical, skeptical about getting the vaccine, but after reading along for, and I've been doing these posts for two months, you know, every day. Um, and they said, you know, after seeing what you went through, I, I got, you know, first in line. And, and that's, you know, that's been really great. I've, I've only had, I've had very few people want to argue with me about, you know, whether I was sick or. Yeah, there are people that will do that though. Oh, so, you know, well, just... One lady said, you know, were you wearing a mask? And I said, yes. And she goes, well, then masks don't work. And I said, well, it, it, that's, that's not how this works. You know, this, you know, um, every time you get in a car, you don't have a car crash. Yeah. So you can't say, oh, well, I, I just, I, my seatbelt's not working. I mean, it's, it's the masks, the distancing, the, the, you know, closing down certain things. Those are all just, just measures that help reduce the prevalence. You know, none of them are said to be a cure. Um, they just reduce the odds that it's going to affect you or somebody you come in contact with. Well, if That's you had been wearing, a, if you had not been wearing a mask and you've been asymptomatic, you did spread right. it to a lot of people during that sure. during the party, for instance. But if exactly. you had the mask on, you could have spread it to even that many more people. And that's where masks, I of think, course. matter. Yeah, of course. You know, yeah. I, it, it was funny because I mean, I lost a, a coworker and friend of mine at the same time you had, and he was forty-eight. Mm -hmm. uh, a former coworker of mine, uh, just a good guy. And he just, it took him within a week. And then my sister got it, then you got it. And it yeah. was like, I'm gonna go get my vaccine now. Oh, you're right. Yeah. It was, it was very powerful motivation to go ahead and go and get ahead and get that shot. Yeah, I, I would encourage anybody just to, you know, follow the guidelines and get the shot. It's, you know, people say, oh, well, I can't breathe with the mask on or, oh, you know, you're yeah. breathing in all that CO2 makes me not able to think. And it's, it's like, just stop. Just, you know, neurosurgeons operate on your brain for, for hours at a time wearing masks that are much heavier than these things they ask us to wear. And they're and you're still trusting them to operate on your brain, you know, so you can wear it for five minutes to go get your your, you know, your hamburger, your hamburger. Exactly. Um, it's and the, the I don't know. It's. We as a nation haven't, you know, we haven't had to endure much inconvenience uh, since World War II, you know, and it's people confuse, you know, freedom with and liberty and they throw out all these words that it's, it's not about that. It's about, it's about being a good citizen. It's about, it's about being a good citizen for, for other people. And it's not about you. It's about, the person you come in contact with. It's about your grandmother. It's about your family. It's about, you know, being your brother's keeper. And, and to me, that's, that supersedes any, you know, what's the old expression that, you know, uh, my liberties end at the tip of your nose, you know, and, and I just think it's important that people stop thinking about themselves and, Think about, you know, what they can do to do their part in something that is, you know, not just in this country, this thing's worldwide. It, it has people try to blame it on American politics, uh, Democrat versus Republican. And somebody in Myanmar doesn't care about American politics and the disease is rampant there. Nobody in India is giving, you know, a rat's ass about American politics, yet the disease is still there. It's a virus. Uh, so, it just wants in our lungs, you know. It, it's, it's a virus, and it's um, it doesn't care. Yeah. Let me ask you this. I, I, you know, like Seth said, somebody very close to me had it, and she said after, and she got really sick too. 
and she was very fortunate that her oxygen didn't get down but to 92 but she was still just like a fever for three and a half weeks <clears throat> yeah. sick the whole time anyway she's come out of it and she's just basically said you know I, so many things that i thought were important before this thing are just oh. trivial now just don't matter how has this how has this changed you uh it, it and I, I don't mean to sound overly dramatic but almost dying has a great way of straightening out your priorities um it there there are just like your friend said there are so many things that i just let it slide you know um there's so there's so many things i used to get so worked up about that now i mean i have a i have a very different focus uh on what i want to do minute to minute day to day year to year for the rest of my life um and, and have being that having something frighten you that much yeah. especially and this is pretty unique for me in that i got this fantastic news and had this you know incredible life-changing event right before i got sick that you know, I've got this brand new daughter. There's this new person in my life. There's this new person in my the life of my family, you know, and and then to go immediately from that to facing your own mortality uh, was kind of a an acceleration of what your friend was talking about. Yeah. Uh, it, it just put an exclamation point on the same things that um, that there's some things that are really important and there's some things that just are not important at all i've stopped arguing with people on facebook as much that's <laughs> i was really, gonna ask that's probably uh, number one i used to be i used to just, oh you were yeah you were just get on there and just oh you are so wrong and um <laughs> now i just just let it go man yeah. just let it go let me ask you this the Obviously, you're in the restaurant business. And like I said, I mean, your story, even without these two components with 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 finding a daughter and having COVID, it, it mean, it'd be worthy just to sit down and talk to you, getting to chase your dream from going from, you know, being an investment banker to boom. Now, suddenly you're doing restaurants. You had the restaurant in Jackson. You, sure. Then you were out on the road doing, you know, cooking things. And then y'all moved to Louisiana, out to Shreveport. Now you made your way down to New Orleans. I mean, so you've had a really cool life, but but the, the restaurant business has taken it on the chin. You know, I've talked with Jeff Good, I've talked with Robert St. John. Oh. You know, I mean, these guys are like just generally when you think about it in the business, they've 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 seen it and done it and done everything and they've struggled this year. And I know y'all have struggled. What have y'all done that to, to be able to keep going during this time? So the 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 things the government have done, the PPP and the CARES Act, um, have been just lifelines yeah. um, and being able to adapt on the fly to just being able to just adapt and respond and make changes on the fly uh, is what's going to define successful restaurants from the ones that we've lost. Um, when, when all this first started, I was at a restaurant called Galliano um, and Galliano is a CBD uh, in the business district, uh, just outside of the French Quarter, uh, we were one block from the convention center, yeah. and um, and right across the street from a Marriott hotel. And so, I would say seventy five percent of the business was strictly linked to the convention center and uh, and downtown tourism. And we went from doing two hundred people at lunch to doing 10 people at lunch wow. and so the we had a meeting with the with the management and said let's do this let's lay off everybody um because you know you, we had some incentives um where people could get you know um uh enhanced unemployment benefits we said, let's lay off everybody because if we furlough anybody, they won't be eligible for the benefits. Yeah. And let's just close the restaurant and concentrate on, you know, cleaning the place and you know doing a deep clean, doing, you know, infrastructure changes. And I reached out to a friend of mine with uh, World Central Kitchen mm -hmm. and um, 
said, listen, I've got, you know, we're, we're shutting down the restaurant. I'm going to have a lot of time on my hands. Is there anywhere I can volunteer for a WCK? Uh, Cause at that time, uh, you know, they weren't, they weren't present in uh, Louisiana. And my friend said, hold where, hold where you are. Uh, we're trying to think of, you know, a way to work within restaurants during COVID. And so um, Jose Andres's organization, World Central Kitchen, what they would normally do is after a disaster, they would set up a, like a tent city of chefs and they would cook thousands and thousands and thousands of meals and feed it to people who were affected by a hurricane or an earthquake or uh, tornadoes. And with COVID, they couldn't come in and pack all those chefs together because we couldn't be next right. to each other. Um, and the restaurants were in terrible financial condition. So what they decided to do was take all the money that was donated to WCK and pay restaurants to make meals. Oh, wow. And so they um, worked to find organizations that needed mass feedings, first responders, the convention center, hospital, um, you know, all kinds of charities, which now couldn't have volunteers and couldn't have, and were losing donations and <clears throat> schools. Cause the, the kids who were, who were getting meals from schools were no longer getting meals. You know, it was, it was pretty dire. And so world central kitchen said, if we pay the restaurants $10 a meal, but we're buying 500 meals at a time, um, the economies of scale for that, would allow a restaurant to bring in two or three chefs. You don't need bartenders, don't need servers, don't need all that. Um, cook 500 meals at a time, put them into go boxes, and we'll handle the, the um, logistics of determining where the food goes and we'll pick it up and deliver it. And so Galliano was one of the first restaurants signed on with World Central Kitchen and um, we actually helped them recruit other restaurants. And so that restaurant survived because they did hundreds of meals a day for first responders uh, and were paid enough to keep the lights on, you know, yeah. until we got into phase one and could reopen and, you know, start, start serving food again. And so, um, that, that kind of forward thinking and the ability to, to turn on a dime and go from doing, you know, high end businessman lunches to doing meat and threes in a styrofoam box for 500 people at a time. Um, the ability to change like that, uh, allowed Galliano to stay open, uh, and they're open now. Um, other restaurants, you know, tried to go to to go models or, um, you know, tried to to hang on to doing business the way they used to and, and weren't able to weren't able to make it. We lost um, probably twenty percent of all the independent restaurants in New Orleans uh, are closed down permanently. Um, and the ones that survived are the ones who were able to say, "This is a different time." We have to think differently. We have to respond differently, and we have to find um, new ways of thinking and new ways of generating revenue until things come back to normal. That's a very and, stoic way of thinking, you know. And I mean, you think about—I mean, and that can apply to not only just into restaurants, into but anybody during this time, you know. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's it's been you know what what's going to happen, and we're seeing it now is that the pent up demand for going out to eat. I mean, just the simple act of going out to eat is there. And as, as they've, as the city has eased regulations, demand has risen to meet everything we can put out. Um, and now that the vaccines are, are getting more widely distributed, we're seeing um, an older population yeah. um, start coming in and in, in dining out. Um, we're seeing you know, we're just seeing a different, we're seeing faces that we haven't seen before. Um, and, and people are really excited to slip back into some normalcy of 
of going out and having brunch or you know having a having a nice piece of fish at dinner uh people really want that and they um the restaurants that survive this uh are going to see a boom time and you know what's going to change is that you know restaurants operate on the slimmest margin you can imagine um restaurants operate on about a three percent net margin that's it three percent um and that will have to change um which is gonna mean that going out to eat in a restaurant a fine dining the restaurant uh is gonna be a little more expensive um but not so expensive that it's prohibitive mm -hmm. but it's got to get more expensive because the restaurants can't stand another hit like this right um it, you know the chilies of the world and the you know um big chain fast casual restaurants of the world you know they make their money uh they operate on a much different margin because they make their money on buying power they make their money on centralizing management and back office support and so you know a, a, a group like a like a macaroni grill or a you know pf changs you know for every 10 restaurants they've got the same amount of back office support so the same amount of back office support i need you know to run one restaurant they can run 10. Uh, so they run on a different margin. The independent restaurants are, um, you know, they're, they're, they're businesses of passion. And there's only so long that passion will sustain you if you're only making 3%. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we talked about uh, realigning priorities. A lot of these restaurateurs have just said, I, I'm not willing to go through the great sacrifices that I go through um for this small margin and so i think going out to eat in a restaurant will probably get a little more expensive um and and just the way restaurants operate uh now that now that they've had to operate with with a little more distancing a little more you know uh a little more careful operation. I think a lot of that's going to carry over. And I think we're going to see a redefining of what, especially fine dining, um, cause that's the lowest margins of all is, is fine dining. You would think that the more expensive the restaurant, the higher the margin, but the more expensive the restaurant, the more stuff it's the tablecloths. It's the right. you know, front waiter, back waiter, waiter, captain, and busser. It's, you don't have the turnover, you know, you just, it's, no. it's yeah. No, it's the fact that you know you sit down at a table and you're there for an hour and a half, right. as opposed to you know going to a fast casual restaurant. You're there for forty minutes. Yeah. Um, so I think you'll see a realigning uh, and a rethinking of um, of how restaurants operate, um, and that's something that's long overdue. Um, I think that the ones that made it are going to excel, and the ones that didn't make it, they're not coming back. Yeah. Uh, they're not coming back as what they were. Right. Um, you know, upper line restaurant was, I mean, the epitome of a uptown fine dining restaurant, and that you know they 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 may never reopen. Yeah. Um, Jason Goodenough, a friend of mine, closed Carrollton Market and said, you know, I I'm not coming back. So um, it's. You know, we're going to see some changes, and and frankly, some of those changes are welcome. Some of them are scary. Yeah, definitely. Tom, any final thoughts before I let you go? I don't want to hog too much of your time, but I mean, you've done great so far. I got to admit, your oxygen has held out. Uh, you know, my my daughter will probably watch this and be and scold me about <laughs> not checking my oxygen after a you know um, hour long conversation. But uh, no, I I think I think we've really covered it, and I I, I would just encourage everyone to you know no matter what the rules and regulations are just be smart um you know i know mississippi has lifted the mask mandate but that the virus doesn't know that um uh and you know get vaccinated and and just yeah you know, I, I close all of my all of my posts with the same thing i say be safe be kind be helpful and that's that's really the sums up how I, how I feel about this, you know, the whole situation. 
How can folks find you online? Um, you know, if you just Google Tom Ramsey, you'll find something. Yeah, you're, um, an, you're a football player. Well, or a math teacher in Hawaii. Yeah, um, or my uncle. Or your uncle. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm on, uh, I'm on Facebook. If you just, if you just type in uh, Chef Tom Ramsey on Facebook, I'm pretty easy to find. Instagram, Twitter, same thing. Uh, and, you know, and if you're in New Orleans, come to a Chafalaya and we'll feed you. I'd love to see you. I tell you what, I can't wait to get back down there. It's been a year, so it'll, it'll be nice to come back down. But I'm glad you're doing better. I worried about you for a long time through a few Thanks. prayers your way, but I'm glad to see you're, you're back in, in, in almost in fighting shape. I am uh, I'm getting there, and uh, hopefully soon I'll be, I'll be back on the motorcycle and back in the kitchen. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Marshall.